been a long road, but he's finally here. I just wanted to say a few words before we begin this uh, defense. Um, so again, most of us know Joel in his capacity as a graduate student here at Notre Dame. Uh, but if you watch the local news, you may, you may get a, a window into a completely different side of Joel. Um, uh, a life of, of crime and intrigue. Um, for instance, uh, Joel had some trouble downtown uh, not too long ago where he was uh, bugged at gunpoint, right? It's, yeah. Yikes. Couple recounts story of uh, being robbed at gunpoint in downtown South Bend. Wait, wait, here's, a, here's a picture of the, <laughs> the, unhappy, uh, the unhappy couple. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's me and Carly. And my grandparents were there, and they were also mugged. They were also with us. <laughs> oh, that is this. Oh, we have more victims in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone who was there. Yeah, they took my phone. They took my phone. My phone and my coat. Yeah, they took your coat too. Yeah. It, was, it was winter and they took his coat. Your last time somebody pointed a gun at you? Well, it's a long time ago now. Yeah, so okay. well, I wasn't at the time. It wasn't, yeah, it was a terrible, <laughs> terrible <laughs> situation. Uh, but Joel was all over the news. I mean, the videos are still there. You can go, uh, you know, any any local news outlet and Joel will be there, you know, uh, recounting the, <laughs> the incident. <laughs> Notre Dame student, Rob at gunpoint. Um, but you know, the news, it just keeps unfolding. <laughs> 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 here's, a, here's a more recent incident. I was, I was trying to get in touch with Joel. This is true too. This is true too. True too. Right before the ICCD deadline, Joel, where are you? We need to meet about the paper. And Joel's like, sorry, I'm with Metro Homicide right now. <laughs> uh, and so this, well, that, I, that this is an unrelated that. incident to the mugging. Yeah. yeah. You have a dime for every time you get that. Right, exactly. <laughs> I so, the, so the cops know him. Yeah, Joel's a regular witness. Uh, <laughs> South Rico. So, so what, where will Joel's uh, life you know, take him next? Uh, tune in to the 6 o'clock news about uh, uh, where things are going. <laughs> All right, with that, I will turn it over. Did you know the woman is killed? I unfortunately did, yes. Yeah. yeah, the interview's online, you could. I will look now. Yeah, the, inter the interview is... Uh, Unfortunately, using that. <laughs> they, they like pointed a camera at me. I'm, I'm going to send this to Blanca and to Colette. I mean, they're going to sure. let you know what's going on with you. Man. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Well, thank Joel, you very much. Hold your passport. Oh, to share your screen. Nobody look. There's <laughs> first. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> I wasn't uh, quite expecting that introduction, but it did, it did uh, brighten my mood. Quite a bit. So, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. There's a lot of people here for 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, so I appreciate you all coming out. Uh, or, or 3 p.m. Or 3 p.m. if you're in London. So that's exactly right. Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, my dissertation is titled Advancing Biometrics and Image Forensics Through Vision and Learning Systems. Uh, it's uh, covering all of the projects I've done in the past five years as a student here at Notre Dame. So we're gonna hop right in because we've got uh, a hard deadline to meet here. And uh, quick go over an overview of what I'll be talking about. Uh, I was on three main projects while uh, here as a graduate student. The first two were on facial re-identification and facial finalization. I'll quickly, uh, briefly cover those, and then we'll move on to parts three, four, and five, which is more than the potatoes of my dissertation, uh, and that's on image forensics and uh, image retrieval for something called wash provenance. Huh? Do we have audio? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. You may want to step just closer to the mic. A little bit closer? So. Oh, can you hear me better now? Yeah, don't be too intimidated. <laughs> yeah, Kevin, we'll try to repeat any questions that come up uh, so you can hear them. Because the room, I mean, this is a packed room, and everybody's all the way back, so. Grouping this morning to center. We could do that. Yeah, just let me know. Just feel free to interrupt at any point if you can't hear something or you need me to repeat something. I got it going. Okay. 
And then that goes for everyone else too. If you've got questions or need me to repeat something, please feel free to ask. Uh, also, I should mention too, as the chair of this committee, we will do uh, questioning at the end. So we'll open up the floor after Joel concludes and anybody can ask anything. Uh, try to hold most of your questions to that question and answer period at the end, um, just for the sake of keeping this moving. Um, uh, and then the committee will have a private session afterwards where we will interrogate Joel more intensely. <laughs> interrogate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, moving along, we have, uh, we'll first talk about facial re-identification. A quick overview of one of the first projects I did once I got here. Uh -oh. There we go. So re-identification is uh, the problem of if you have multiple cameras placed around uh, a given area, you want to take a particular uh, instance of a person, say me, and match that with uh, the same person at a different point in time or place, uh, possibly even from a different camera. There are quite a few data sets out there that do this, or that are made to uh, test algorithms that do this. Um, here are six of the main ones used in the literature. However, you'll notice that a lot of these are uh, frontal images or images that don't look like they're from an angle that you normally see in some type of closed circuit camera. So in 2014 and 15, we uh, collected a new data set, which we called the Vibolo data set, uh, for video be on the lookout. And in this data set, we had multiple actors appear at different cameras wearing different clothing to simulate um, time jumps. Uh, we collected data at a bunch of different cameras from the uh, Cleveland, the regional Cleveland Greater Transport Authority. I can never quite get that right. The Cleveland, Cleveland regional. regional. Okay, Cleveland, Cleveland Regional Greater Transport Authority, yes. um, which was a real closed circuit uh, TV network. And you were um, hanging around with the cops on this one too. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> they, they drive us around. Um, they drive us around and escort us to the different locations to collect data. So we'll focus mainly on Triscuit Bridge and Glenwood for the next uh, couple of slides. Here what you see on the left is a state-of-the-art algorithm uh, called SDOLF running on all of those six data sets that I showed a couple slides ago. Um, and on those data sets, it looks like it works really well, like the problems you can solve maybe. But after collecting our Vibolo data, um, we ran the same algorithm on the, uh, uh, on the Vibolo data on the right. And what we see is this flat line. And what that flat line means is that it's performing pretty close to uh, random in terms of being able to recognize or re-identify people. So uh, fascinatingly, changing clothes and having this particular uh, uh, real-world <coughs> camera setup really makes state-of-the-art algorithms fail on this type of data. None of those were the HD data set, were they? Uh, well, one of them is. So the Glenwood. Uh, oh, Glenwood was. Glenwood was okay. HD. Okay. Yeah. So we decided to use uh, the lower resolution faces in the database um, to try and build a more stable descriptor of a person that wasn't reliant on clothing. Uh, we did this by using a biologically inspired neural network from the uh, Cox and Pinto lab, uh, and then a SVM classifier uh, for our verification. And in doing so, we were able to greatly increase the efficacy of um, uh, re-ID on this Vibolo data set. And our method is the, uh, the two bolded blue and red lines there. So this project had a couple of papers that we published from it. Uh, the first one was at VTOS in 2016, and then a subsequent paper uh, which uh, my colleague Amy was able to publish on the data set, uh, a part of the curated data set itself. So part two uh, is on facial fertilization. This was my second project here. Um, it's in the same vein of work. Uh, however, in this, this particular problem, we want to take a face that's been rotated on some <coughs> odd direction out of pose from the camera and uh, artificially rotate it back into frontal pose, thus the name frontalization. And to do that, we came up with a pipeline that used uh, uh, facial landmark points or fiducial points, <coughs> excuse me, to triangulate uh, different areas of the face, and then we would do a piecewise um, perspective transform on those triangulated face pieces. 
Here's a video of that working. Uh, this is not real time. We slowed it down by like a magnitude of 100. Um, so we can see exactly uh, how the frontalization works in its piecewise manner. Uh, we took this method and pitted it against a few other frontalization methods um, and found that this piecewise frontalization uh, worked pretty well and actually gave us uh, uh, pretty great results compared to a bunch of other um, a bunch of other frontalization methods that are all below our line. We then took that algorithm uh, and applied it to a challenge in 2016 called the ICB RW challenge, where a pan tilt zoom camera uh, took close up snapshots of people's faces as they walked through a, uh, an alleyway. And then uh, we were again given the re-identification problem of trying to uh, re-identify them when they walked back through the alley some other point in time during the day. Uh, this was the pipeline we put together that utilized both the biologically inspired neural network from the uh, first part of uh, the presentation and the frontalization method I just described. Uh, and using this particular pipeline, we were able to get fifth place in, uh, in the challenge and uh, that landed us a publication in uh, IEEE Intelligent Systems. So this project had uh, a few different papers we published from it. Uh, the first was actually um, part of a video recognition evaluation in BTOS for 2016. Uh, then we also got to publish in WAPD uh, for the algorithm itself, and then the intelligent systems article um, for the competition. All right, so that was a really brief overview of what I, what I used to do. Now we're moving into what I do now, and that is image uh, retrieval and forensics for image provenance in particular. So first, let's go over kind of what general image forensics is. Say you have an image like this, and you are um, a little bit suspicious of, uh, suspicious of it for some reason. So you run it through an algorithm, and you want that algorithm to tell you what areas may have been tampered with in that image. This is a particular algorithm called Splice Buster, um, and it was designed to find areas of an image that don't actually belong or have been composited in. So then you can look at this map, which we call the tamper heat map, uh, and determine, well, maybe that flag wasn't originally there, and someone put it there to try and make a point. Unfortunately, these algorithms don't always work very well. So here's a, an image of our lab, which I am not in, and one of my colleagues, Amy, uh, is not in either. So I took it upon myself to Photoshop both of us in. Um, and now, now we're both in this image, but it's pretty clear we don't belong there. Our, uh, the, the lighting angles and the illumination is, is different enough that you can easily tell that uh, we weren't originally there for this picture. However, when you run it through Splice Buster, that algorithm that's supposed to be state of the art, uh, unfortunately it doesn't find either of us. Instead, it finds a partner. <laughs> uh, and we assume it's because She's the only one wearing a red shirt. Um, and that red is the most salient thing in the image, so it kind of latches on to that. So digital image forensics, while useful, can be uh, a bit sensitive to noise. Why did it fail? Not entirely sure. It can't be the color. You don't think so? I, I can't believe that's going to be spatial. She was well, definitely there, though. It's texture. <laughs> okay, I, I believe that. Texture. I believe the texture. I believe yeah. yeah, it very well could be because uh, her shirt is uh, has got a very, very definite pattern on it. It's a good point. So we want to be able to utilize image forensics algorithms like Splice Buster, but we also want a way to be able to validate their results and to find um, more and better uh, examples of why an image may not be real or forged. So. Uh, enters now image provenance. So what is image provenance? That's uh, the evolution of an image. So take this image, which was posted to Reddit. This is actually real, he's not floating. He's standing on a, a crystal clear ice on Lake Michigan, actually. Um, the internet got a hold of it, and someone uh, photoshopped in a paddle board and a couple of, um, a couple of sharks underneath him. And it actually looks almost more real here. 
However, you're able to go online and find the exact images they used to make this composite. So now that you see these images, you can look at that bottom image and say, oh, well, that's, that's clearly a fake image because he used these, uh, he used these other images to donate objects. Uh, additionally, someone else got a hold of the image and uh, pasted in this guy from uh, meme pop culture. He's dancing at, at a wedding, I think it is, with like a beer in his hand. And he's very easy to find on the internet too, the original picture. Does he have the name? I don't know what the name is of the name. I don't, I don't follow It's like these probably things. dancing guy. Is he a good answer? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and then someone piggybacked off that and put in uh, a, a picture of this guy who comes from a viral video um, where, where this uh, man tries to dive into a frozen oh, pool. I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, he just like wrecks himself. So, uh, so all together, this creates what we call a provenance graph. With the image in green here being the original host, these blue images as donors, and these red images as the final composites. So I, I know we'll be one of the questions at the end, but I can't the, resist. The MIDI is free to <laughs> so is there is there a generally accepted definition of image provenance? Oh, that is a fantastic question. <laughs> there, is, there is a generally accepted definition for image phylogeny. Okay. Um, however, I'm not entirely sure about if there is uh, one unifying definition of prominence. Uh, the, the answer is no. In fact, we've discussed this uh, we have in the API meetings. Yeah. In fact, the, the last meeting it came up, you know, it's like, what is the definition that this kind of proposed is not correct? And I think the, well, the, the, the program agrees to that now. But there's no but their definition is correct or not? It's not correct. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, and so, which is kind of nice because this is an open area of research. So, I mean, our team in particular has proposed, right, a number of different ways to do this, and we're still thinking about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and usually there's a lot of ambiguity in the edges and the, the arrows um, for the relationships between images because you're not entirely sure if someone made the. Uh, so, I, I guess the question would be is recovering the graph enough? Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, and I would say in some cases it is, and in some cases you need more information as to. And remember, Neil kept on saying he didn't think a graph was important. Remember that? Yeah, that's right. The, to, to DARPA, so, the filtering was the most important. Right. Which is good news for Joel. Because yeah. What he works. I, yeah, right. 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 I work mostly on the filtering end of yeah. things. Um, yeah. So I, I work on collecting these images. So, with the same example, I'm saying, well, if if I get uh, this image as a query, I want to get all of these back as my uh, retrieved images from some image search algorithm. Even this one, which is not related in any way to the original query, except tangentially through this guy there. So it's an order of, uh, of two deg degrees of separation, pretty much. You still want all those images, though. So a normal image search algorithm is going to fail. Can we turn down the lights in the front so that the screen images would be clearer? Uh, Probably. <laughs> there are red. Oh, those are gas valves. <laughs> 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 oh, that's happening. Oh, that's but no, sir. Yeah, so you're, you're going to disappear as far as Kevin's concerned. Oh, uh, Dr. Boyer, can you see me? I can see you. Uh, okay. All right. This works. So before we move on to solving this particular type of field problem, we'll define a couple of the uh, um, pieces of terminology we have. Uh, we have near duplicate images. These are one type of image we want to retrieve. They're images that uh, are structurally identical, however, have been changed in uh, some photometric way, like cropping or exposure or some type of filter. And then there's semantically similar images, which may be images of the same instance of an object or uh, place or person at different angles uh, or camera, uh, cameras or times. And then we also have um, these three definitions for a host image, a donor image, and a borrower image. Uh, given the image on the top here as a query, uh, a host image is defined as the canvas for which uh, the, the composite was built, if the query is a composite. Uh, a donor is simply just an image that donates an object to the query, and a borrower is an image that borrows content from the query and uses it in a different context. So how do we find all these types of images? Uh, our initial approach was kind of a five-step 
uh, algorithm. There was a local feature description, then compression of those features, then we built uh, a structure called an inverted file index. Uh, we then made a retrieval algorithm called feature voting from that index, and then uh, further expansion of the retrieved results. So we'll go over those in a little bit more detail. Local feature description, uh, pretty simple for those of you who haven't worked with local image features. Um, all you do is you basically pinpoint down spots on an image of high information, like edges and corners, and then you go into those areas, uh, we'll zoom in here, and uh, look at the pixels in a closer neighborhood, split those pixels up, describe the area in terms of local pixel gradients, um, create pixel gradient histograms, and then concatenate those histograms into a final feature descriptor vector. Um, in this case, it's a 64 dimensional vector. And it can be matched with other features using just a distance, like an L2 distance. So now that we have our feature descriptor, uh, in this case, uh, we normally use surf. Um, say we have a gallery of images, in this case just three images, that we want to be able to index and put into a structure that we can search. So let's extract all of their local features and then put them into this unified space. Now this would be 64 dimensions, uh, like I just stated, but for visualization purposes we'll use two dimensions. Um, we can uh, take these features and compress them by using a product quantization table. Uh, and all that is, is uh, basically each of these squares you see is a bin, and whatever location that vector, that feature descriptor falls into, uh, it is put in that subsequent bin. Now, this were particular- Were your low level, your features, were they all low level things like edges and corners? Did you go like one level up, maybe looking at saliency or something like that? We did actually try saliency with um, uh, MSER, uh -huh. um, maximally stable regions. Right. Um, however, we found that one, the algorithm's pretty slow, so it takes a lot to, um, to perform all the extractions. Uh, and two, it wasn't giving us a lot of coverage difference, but we do have a slightly different method for collecting the key points that uh, I have a slide on in a little bit. So this product quantization table has a bunch of empty space in it. A lot of those bins are unused. So we can take it one step further and do something called optimized product quantization, which allows you to um, find the optimal rotation of all of your data points so that you can have as few empty bins as possible. So now we went from 40 some unused space to down to 20 some unused space. So now that we've got this product quantization table set up, uh, we can use it as an inverted file index by simply uh, saying, well, what features are close to this feature? Go to that <coughs> bin and then find all the other features that lie in that bin or the surrounding bins. So let's take a query image, uh, extract features, and then submit each feature individually to the index. And what we find is that it does have matches. These features do have matches. Uh, we have two, two matches with this panda. Uh, maybe two matches for this squirrel. And then we end up having four matches for the cat, one of which is um, a repeat match. So after looking at the votes, we can say with more certainty that maybe there's something uh, common between Superman and that cat. And when you look closer at Superman, you can say, oh, well, actually, there very much is. The uh, Superman's logo on his shirt is, is the cat's mouth. Um, and actually, his pants are too, if you're looking closely enough. So now we can take that image, since we know it has some type of shared content. We call it uh, our, one of our tier one search results. We can submit that image back to the index uh, after we extract more features and then we can retrieve images that contain content from the cat. And now we can connect these images back to the original query, and this is what we call, um, uh, uh, this is what we call search expansion. So getting to your question, we did find that uh, normal surf key point <coughs> extraction, which uses the, uh, basically, uh, the Hessian matrix as a, like a response matrix, doesn't quite get everything we want. Uh, so like these areas have low support here, um, especially out here, even though it's just a completely black region. So uh, we came up with distributed surf, um, 
which allowed you to support regions of more homogeneity than, um, than the original algorithm. And that's what we use for all of our experiments. So uh, now that we have this way of s submitting search queries to an index filled with images, we want to be able to use uh, uh, context analysis of the, our results to better refine that uh, expansion, that second tier search that we have. So say we have our query image um, and we submit to the database and get our results. Well, we want to have some method in which we can extract some of those results to get comparable images to the query and then um, in some way or another compare those images so that we can extract one of those tampered heat maps. Um, we came up with a few different methods. Uh, here's just a quick overview of some different ways we decided to try that type of comparison. Um, and we tested these different methods under a lot of different noise perturbations and things, since uh, a pixel to pixel subtraction doesn't work well. We then performed an experiment in which we took an index of about a million high resolution images um, built uh, sorry, we took a million high resolution images, built an index out of them, and then uh, ran this algorithm to do image forensics. Uh, and then we tested those results against results from uh, 12 of the top image forensics, uh, blind image forensics algorithms at the time, which don't use other images. They just look at that single image. And we found that by far um, we can do significantly better with any of those algorithms uh, that we just had on the last slide. Uh, those comparison algorithms naturally because if you can find images that are different you can very easily um, pinpoint which areas have changed. So now that we have this uh, particular comparison algorithm we want to be able to take the alien region that we extract from the host and use that as our query expansion. So we'll take this alien region down here, resubmit it to the index there, and then retrieve a second stage of query results that are based only on the pixels from the alien region, and then we can get other images that are related to just that donor. So hopefully in this, uh, this particular stage, you'll retrieve the donor. Um, you'll most likely retrieve the host in this particular stage, if it exists within the database. And then you can connect them all together to get a host donor composite triplet, which allows you to start building that problem script. And then here's some results from that. Um, you can see in the stage two, uh, of the search, we start picking up these feet, which were composited in, uh, and we weren't able to catch those in the first stage. Uh, additionally, we ran this on a bunch of different ways of constructing that image index beyond product quantization, and found that it doesn't matter how you build the index, this context incorporation uh, improves your results for provenance filtering uh, any, way, any way you have it. Additionally, we had uh, a challenge from uh, NIST on who is creating the data sets for the Metaphor project, which with, this, uh, uh, with which this project is funded. And here are results from uh, one of those challenges. We were able to utilize distributed SURF, iterative filtering, and both put together to get um, the highest uh, score possible. So all of this work together um, produced four publications, three to ISEP 2017 in Beijing, and one to uh, transactions on image processing. Okay, so that all being said, um, the algorithm works pretty well, but there's a lot of pain points, right? So there's some things about this type of iterative retrieval that don't work well. Uh, so we wanted to move on and try and expand and extend and build a new algorithm that could fix those pain points. So what's wrong with the previous algorithm? Well, features are bursty. So if you look over here, a lot of the features from these windows match with tons of other windows. That's what a bursty feature is. That makes our matches noisy, and it means that our small donors, um, oh, sorry, it, uh, it means that our small donors may be lost in, uh, in all of that noise. Additionally, they don't get enough votes from the small amounts of key points that they may, uh, they may get. Uh, lastly, iterative querying takes a really long time because you have to extract the features, perform some type of spatial analysis between images, and then create an entire new query to the index. And we don't want to take a lot of time because we want to be able to do this as close to real time as possible. So we took a step back and decided to redefine the problem 
to know exactly what we what it is that we wanted our search algorithm to do. And uh, after redefining the problem, we came up with this name, which is objects and scenes to objects and scenes, which we just call OS to OS. And in this search scenario, we'll take uh, our dog again, who is at the picnic, and uh, we say, with one shot, we want to take this image uh, as a query. And without having to re-query the index, we want to be able to find all of these different types of images, the host, the donor, and the borrower all, uh, without having to go back. So say you were to submit an image like this to an algorithm that solves the OS to OS problem, without uh, telling it exactly what you want, you'd want it to be able to find the host image of this forest and of this woman on a swing. Uh, that is important. However, you also need it to find all of these other little tiny images that have made up this composite. You may not have known were there to begin with, um, and you want the algorithm to figure that out for you. Unfortunately, the previous algorithm works with number of feature matches <coughs> as the score for your returned, uh, your returned images. So that means that an image of the host will score very high in the ranks, probably rank one, because it shares almost all of its features with the query. However, you'll probably also get a lot of images of other trees um, or forests, because trees and forests share a lot of the same types of features, and since it's simply just feature matches, uh, you'll have a high score. Perhaps you'll still get a high score for this one on the swing, However, all of these other images are going to get really low scores because they only have you know, 10, 15 key points on them. Unfortunately, these are all true matches, and this one shouldn't match at all. So you would hope this would be way down in the ranks, um, but that isn't the case with our previous algorithm. Instead, we want, uh, we want to be able to make our algorithm suppress this image and uh, raise all of these scores instead so that we get a graph that looks more like this. Uh, how do we go about doing that, exactly? Well, uh, you could use an object detector, um, and you could detect objects first and submit them into a query, um, uh, each individually. However, it's really slow. Um, you're going to find that your object index is going to grow uh, exponentially with all of the objects uh, in a given image. It's going to rely heavily on the efficacy of the object detector, so if you're getting a whole ton of false objects, uh, it'll make your index grow far beyond what you want. Uh, and the query size is also going to be indefinite. So you may be querying 100 objects uh, per, per original image query. So instead, we propose a needle in the haystack filtering, which is comprised of four stages. Uh, index construction, which is identical to what we were just talking about, or nearly identical. Um, focal point calculation, projection to those focal points, and then finally object level scoring. So what do we mean by that? Say we take our query image here um, and this donor, and say we want to be able to match them to each other. Well, first we're going to uh, extract all of our features from the query, then from the match. Uh, then we'll submit the features from the query to the index. The index will tell us which features are possible matches with the, uh, uh, this particular match image. We can delete all the rest. Um, then we can take the match score for all of these, which is just that distance measure, uh, and use that to create a weighted, uh, a weighted centroid of all of these features, which we call the focal point. And this focal point will sit maybe around here. And what we want this focal point to do is be generally near the objects in the image that may be shared between another image. So we'll see why this focal point is important in a moment. Let's change all the colors so each feature has uh, its subsequent matched feature the same color in the other image. First, let's take uh, this blue feature and describe its location relative to that blue focal point. When we describe that location, we get a vector which we can apply to the match image and put an X down. We can do it again for, say, the orange feature here and put an X down. And we can do that for all of our features and put an X down where it assumes the focal point would be in the match image. You can do the same for all of these erroneous matches. So this yellow match doesn't actually match to anything. This dog matched to grapes. So uh, it'll put, a, it'll put uh, an X down there 
Uh, and all the other matches uh, will do that too. And you'll see that these matches start, um, since they're erroneous, start voting out into nowhere land. And these matches all cluster together because there is structural similarity between um, where they all lie within their respective images. So if we build a density, uh, a density map of where those votes lie, we get something that looks like this. And then an algorithm can easily go through and say, something must have matched here because it is a high density cluster. So what if that image uh, or that object to object match has a rotation in it? Well, that's easily solvable if we extract our features, match them, find the, uh, find the focal point, and then describe our vectors to them. Uh, initially, you might think this looks really bad because since we've rotated our dolphin 90 degrees, uh, all of our feature votes or vector votes are off in nowhere land. But since they're local features and we have ways to describe the angles, of those local features. In this case, it's a line that sits at about 51 degrees. We call that the feature orientation. We can use the feature orientations calculated from the query and the ones calculated from the match and simply subtract them to find how much we need to derotate our feature or our vote vectors by. So we take negative 99 plus 7 or 7 minus 99 to get our rotation for this particular feature. We do that for all of them, and then we do the rotation. And all of a sudden, all of those features line up again. Uh, and since the erroneous matches are still erroneous, they rotate still into nowhere land, thankfully, at least most of the time. And then we can create uh, our density heat map based on those rotated vectors. And that gives us pretty decent rotation invariance. So this entire algorithm is very invariant to uh, horizontal and vertical stretching of objects. Here you can see that focal point that's being voted for. It does break down after a given period of time, but not after until after there's a whole ton of distortion going on. Um, additionally, there is perspective invariance also. So if we do a perspective warping on these objects, we can still keep a pretty strong focal point. And also a fine invariance. Um, same exact deal with the fine. Uh, the focal point stays uh, pretty coherent until you hit a lot of warping. Surprisingly though, we lose a little bit of rotation invariance um, at particular angles. You can see it breaks down, the focal point disappears. And that's uh, because of an artifact with the way Surf um, describes the orientation of its features using uh, wavelets. So this algorithm performs what we call a soft geometric verification between objects. It does it on an object level. There's not really another algorithm out there um, that does it uh, in a similar way to this. However, we did want to see how fast it was compared to other spatial verification methods. So we ran it against a bunch of other algorithms um, from the field that do spatial verification on image retrieval and found that our algorithm is far and away faster than all of them. And that's because it's a linear time complexity algorithm. Everything that we just went over uh, is simple vector calculations put into a matrix and do matrix multiplications and additions on, uh, and that makes it very fast. Another great thing about this algorithm is that it can be run with any local feature. So we use DELF features, um, which stand for uh, deep local attentive features, to further extend this algorithm. Um, in a DELF feature, the really only difference is you take this area that you want to describe, and instead of using those histograms of um, pixel gradients, we use a deep neural network, a convolutional neural network, to uh, generate those description vectors. And then we can also find these key point areas of high interest using a tacked in uh, plugin, basically, to that uh, network architecture called an attention layer. Uh, and that attention layer gives you scores of where you should extract features from. So here we can see on our image the attention layer, this is the actual attention layer of that uh, deep neural network shows uh, that it pays a lot of attention to these areas of actual high interest, whereas uh, SERP features are pretty much um, uh, evenly spread, uniformly spread across this image. So it does find all of these donors quite well. It still misses some, but no algorithm is perfect. Uh, we took these methods, ran them through the Oxford 5K and our 6K image retrieval data sets, 
Uh, we found that our scores were very good, especially for Oxford 5K. Um, uh, for both ESERP and DELF, when you add in the NH score or the needle in the haystack scoring, um, you have a significant increase by almost 30 some percent. Uh, we don't do state of the art on uh, Paris 6K because, uh, uh, but we do get close. Deep image retrieval, however, is um, a method that utilizes every single image. It brute forces that match. And here we're building an index and we don't do any brute forcing. So um, I still say that's a win for us because we don't have to brute force the entire data set. Uh, we have results on the MSC 18 challenge data set from the Metaphor project. Uh, we were able to significantly increase our total recall and the donor recall. The donor recall is uh, a measure we made up uh, for determining how many of those small donor images we could collect from a given query. Uh, so using that H score really significantly increases our donor recall, especially using uh, SERP features. Additionally, we ran uh, experiments on Google Landmarks, which uh, is a data set of a few million images of different landmarks, um, all labeled by this Google search algorithm, uh, and found that while our method um, uh, doesn't perform the best for just DSERP when you add in the NH score, um, we significantly improve the results on this yellow curve. Uh, and that yellow curve is DSERP plus NH, which almost does comparably to deep image retrieval in this case. And so that is deep image retrieval, which is a brute force algorithm on millions of images compared to simple SERP features. So some qualitative results here we have uh, from that particular challenge data set. Uh, how, these, how these figures work is this top row is simply just showing you the focal point calculated for any given result of this query. So each column is a result retrieved by the search algorithm. Um, and the top row is the focal point that was calculated for that given search result. This middle image shows you the uh, vote density map from those vote vectors. And then the bottom is just the, these two are the same images. This one just has an overlay <coughs> of that vote density map. So here we see that this, the, uh, uh, the NH search can very quickly and easily find this, uh, this puddle here. Because <coughs> we didn't originally know that puddle was photoshopped in. Uh, until the algorithm found it for us. It also finds uh, different images of the man uh, from, from which he was spliced into the query. Here's some results from Google. Um, the query image was of this, uh, this sign, which is I think for like a football team. Um, and uh, what we find is that the focal point is staying pretty consistent even through perspective transform scaling and rotation, which is, um, uh, pretty fantastic. Uh, here's a really interesting result from uh, our Reddit data set. Uh, I've excluded the collection of our Reddit data set from this, but uh, we also ran experiments on that. These are Photoshop images uh, from Reddit in which we built an index and ran search on. Oops. Um, here we can see that uh, uh, this deer, it's a little bit tough to see because the images are a little small. This deer um, right there has been spliced into a bunch of different images, and the algorithm is able to um, actually find the deer, even when it's just a little cropped version of the head, um, or if there's multiple deers, it, we actually get multiple um, density clusters. Uh, so each of these clusters is certainly an object, and it can show you here that there are four objects um, that have been based there. So we wanted to use this algorithm to do something um, uh, to do something kind of real time, since we had such a fast speed um, coming from the object scoring. So instance mining, this is, uh, this is not our figure, this is a figure from uh, Shen et al, which is still an archive, but it's a fascinating paper. Um, they do instance mining on different <coughs> painters uh, and their uh, corpus of artwork. So what instance mining is, is it's going through uh, a set of images and trying to find uh, similar objects or similar instances of objects like this dog um, or these hands strumming um, whatever instrument that is. And they were able to find things that no one else has ever seen before. Uh, and it's really fascinating. However, their data sets were of 500 images for the bottom and 1,000 images for the top. 
and they used eight GPUs and were able to perform this instance mining in about 48 hours. So it's a very few amount of images, very long amount of time, and a lot of GPUs. We wanted to be able to do it on Reddit, Instagram, Twitter, 4chan, any social media that's uh, got a high influx of images. Um, and we wanted to be able to do it in a, at a speed that is actually useful to the speed of social media. Why would we want to do that? Well, say take for example, in 2018, this is the famous Banksy painting from the auction that got uh, um, completely uh, shredded. Within hours of this being posted on the internet, people were posting modifications. This is like a, a supposed to be some drunk driving uh, PSA. I think that's a license. Um, people are posting memes with overlaid text. Um, people are making statements on things like climate change. People are making statements on government and politics, or advertising, or even just you know having fun. And that's the Kramer. Um, <laughs> but all of these, you wouldn't have any idea what they're trying to convey without the context of the original image of uh, Banksy shredding his artwork with some anti-establishment message. So we propose motif mining which is like instance mining, except it's for big data sets that we're pulling from the internet or from social media. And we want it to be able to be performed as fast as possible and provide general overviews of these trends and motifs, such as that Banksy painting, um, of what people are posting online. So uh, with the help of Bill, uh, we put together a, um, uh, a pipeline that could go about solving this task. Um, we had image scrapers scrape images from different social media sites, put them into an image index using the uh, needle in the haystack object, object indexing method. Uh, then we would run random queries through that index to get object level scores back. And then each of those, um, say, uh, say each image we, we queried returned 1,000 images, we would use each of those 1,000 <laughs> returned results as an edge in a graph. So we would build this sparse affinity matrix. And then we would use that sparse affinity matrix after performing all of the queries uh, to do spatial clustering on the graph, or sorry, spectral <laughs> clustering on the graph. And then those spectral clusters that are returned by the clustering algorithm would contain different motifs, was the idea. Um, here we see kind of the type of graph that uh, our, our motif mining algorithm uh, generates. It's a small world graph meaning that there are hub nodes, these nodes are uh, query images that create, um, or that have a whole, a whole bunch of one degree connected images. These hub nodes have a high degree, uh, and they are connected in between by images that share content. We use this algorithm on uh, data from the 2019 Indonesian election. We did this because it was a huge election, over 20,000 candidates, massive social media presence, um, there was a whole lot of disinformation, misinformation going on uh, during the campaign. And while it's over now, it's still really fascinating to, um, to analyze. So uh, Bill went out and uh, put together a scraper that could scrape uh, images from Twitter. We gathered for an initial experiment 174 some thousand images. Uh, then we built an index using the needle in the haystack method. Um, uh, it only took six hours to build this index with a single GPU and 12 cores. It's on one machine. Uh, then we performed our random 10,000 queries that uh, finished in another six hours on the same machine. And then we did spectral clustering on those random queries. And that took less than an hour to complete the spectral clustering. In this process, there was no deep learning used. You could argue there's no machine learning used uh, unless you consider spectral clustering machine learning in which case there was. Um, and even though there's no deep learning in this method, we started getting fascinating results. I took all the images um, and built a simple Apache web server to host all of the clusters. And what we began to find was that the clusters were actually pulling out really pertinent uh, motifs. So this motif is um, of uh, a scholar, Muhammad Rizek, um, I believe. 
Did anyone correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that? Um, that's this man here. Uh, people in general love the guy. And he's posted all over on social media. And what we find in this cluster is not only uh, the algorithm finding exact matches of the object, but matches of the object in real life on banners, low, low resolution banners in the background, um, on billboards, and on uh, people holding up flags and, and other types of banners. So, uh, oh, additionally, we found that the algorithm was working kind of as a, as a de facto uh, face recognizer. So it did find another instance of the man, uh, completely separate from any of these other, any of these other um, more structured instances. Another motif uh, that we quickly found was clusters that would cluster around this particular hand signal. This is a, uh, the hand signal for, um, I believe, uh, uh, Jakawi, I think. Let me look. Uh, this is for Cabo. My bad. Uh, this is the hand signal to uh, that denotes, I guess, your support for this particular uh, candidate. And we were able to start pulling out images of all sorts of people making these signals, whether it was inadvertently or not, is unclear. Um, but using this algorithm, you could quickly figure out that, huh, this hand signal means something important. Even though we don't speak any Indonesian, um, we can very quickly determine that. Conversely, we have uh, the opposite uh, main candidate, Jakawi, um, running for president, who has his own hand signal, which looks like this. Uh, and we had clusters that started clustering around that hand signal also. Even more fascinatingly, we started seeing clusters of people taking images of this particular uh, uh, billboard in different places, uh, sometimes different sizes, but they all share most of their structure. Um, you can see there's some pretty extreme uh, scale and uh, scale and rotation going on, and it's still finding them, which is fascinating. Uh, but the, the comments on these, if you go and translate the overlay text, is uh, about how they think this is unfair because all of this was done uh, by the Jakawi campaign before the election cycle even started. And everyone's like, well, he's getting a, a leg up on the competition and we think that he's cheating. That's what most of, most of these texts say if you run them through translation. And if you go back and look at the dates of when all these are posted, they were indeed posted before the, uh, the election cycle really began. So this algorithm could be used for something like a, a, an early warning. Uh, we found some other fun clusters. Uh, my girlfriend Carly kind of went through, was having fun um, uh, looking at some of the images and seeing uh, what was, what motifs were coming out. Here's one of the candidates playing basketball. <laughs> and here's one of frogs. I'm not sure why frogs um, were in there, but even, even this little frog on this woman's nose, how, how it picked that up, I'm not entirely sure. So, the future. Where do I see this work going? Um, well, of course, I'd love to see end user systems put together for this type of, uh, these types of pipelines. A system like a Google image search which could uh, provide um, results immediately to a user online and then perhaps with the user in the loop, they can decide which ones they want to research, which things they want to see more information on. Additionally, uh, the clusters, uh, or the, this motif clustering would be fantastic to have some type of end user system um, and to merge this clustering algorithm with things like NLP, with facial recognition, uh, and with deep learning um, sentiment analysis so that we could get good summaries of the sentiment in any one of these clusters. Additionally, we're still working to solve the which came first problem, which is, of course, which of these images came first if you're not given the, uh, the graph? Um, turns out to be a really difficult problem. We've tried a bunch of different methods. Um, we're still working on getting, uh, uh, getting the efficacy up of that algorithm. I would also like to extend this uh, uh, entire set of algorithms into video. So these are TikTok videos. And what you can see is that even as videos, they share, uh, they share things with memes like this dog, um, just normal image memes. This is actually uh, a GAN-generated uh, TikTok. This is the one using the, the um, uh, male-to-female filter. So you can see in the hair um, that it's using, using the filter that actually runs on a GAN. 
they have images that uh, um, share content with videos online and with other TV shows. Additionally, people uh, make reaction videos and reactions on reactions on reactions on reactions. Uh, and these are also going to be really fascinating for prominence filtering. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, everyone who's helped, helped me complete all of this research. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Carly, my girlfriend, um, my good friend Poncho, my family who came here today. I'm using this laser pointer to point at people, so I'm going to set it down. And all of my friends at Notre Dame who have been such a great support the, this past five years. So thank you everyone for coming out, uh, even though it's like a nice summer day. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge my advisors, Dr. Boyer um, and uh, Dr. Walter Shire, my previous advisor, Dr. Patrick Flynn, all of the PIs in the projects uh, that I've been a part of, uh, including uh, Adam and Dr. Delph, and all of my teammates who I've been able to work closely with over the past few years on these projects. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge this myriad of different places uh, in which all of our projects have been funded through. Oh, and I left this in. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so there's me in a master's outfit going to a PhD room. I I know I didn't. I should have. Like this morning, I was sitting there like, oh, I should have run. Uh, it is fake news. So, any questions? Thanks, Joel. Any questions from not the committee? So, anybody else? But the committee? Yes. Yes, we can see who's. Have you considered how your research could be commercially applied to voluntarily contributed data? So like data that included identifying <coughs> information? So in terms of like like the metadata that would like someone saying this is a picture of uh, so so if if say I had a date a database of all my personal connections, uh, up to DNA of anybody who might give me DNA in this oh boy. <laughs> wow. And and I had pictures that I took from my phone of all the people in the room. What could what could you do with that? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, there are works that uh, that work on uh, like say DNA to face people. There there, there are uh, labs that do that. Um, in this particular paradigm of prominence, um, I'm not entirely, you'd be able to maybe do, uh, do things between the images themselves, uh, but in terms of the DNA, like if you're, if you're given a string with, um, that contains you know, whatever genome it is, this particular algorithm is probably not gonna be able to do too well because it's based around images. So it's not gonna be able to determine prominence of some type of family tree or, uh, or relationships in that particular. But it would be fascinating to have a system that uh, could do that, that fused those types of results. And then you could start to see who's related in what ways, especially if you had like a social network like that. You could, you could look at uh, an actual DNA level of the network and then uh, a level of the network based on, say, facial recognition or attribute, um, attribute recognition. Thank you. So. Mm -hmm. okay, oh, yes, sorry. Slide 87. <laughs> oh, I can just type it in, right? Yeah. Okay, so this one you're using Delph, and you're saying that you were able to add in an attention layer, and this is with your needle and the haystack stuff, you can change whatever those features are, or is that? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, so um, the generic surf, um, surf feature algorithm has its own key point detector. Okay. And all that does is um, it detects areas with uh, edges and corners. That's it. And so the Delph uh, attention layer on the network um, is actually trained on SIFT uh, key points, but it's um, the idea is that the, the layer will um, eventually learn a 
better attention yeah. uh, model than just edges. And you're dealing with these steps on top of this? Or? Yeah, it is on top of it. So that's why you can use uh, um, you can use local feature any local feature that you want because needle in the haystack sits on top of those descriptions. Okay. Oh yes. So I don't know anything about any of this, but kind of based on what you talk about in finding these focal points in the image in order to build your algorithm or how you were able to relate this image to another image. Uh -huh. When you kind of like went over your future directions, when you have a video, it's like a series of stacked images. Would that just expand the amount of data you have and bloat your algorithm speed? Yeah, if you were to like apply this directly there, which is, you know, the first thing you think is, oh, just to apply it to the frames. Um, yes, very much so. So you how need, would you avoid that? That's a good question. Um, you'd avoid that uh, probably by taking um, more of a, an average of the video. You'd also split videos up. Um, so you'd use uh, what are called keyframes. Um, uh, when you compress a video, you, uh, the compression algorithm keeps only a particular set of frames and then interpolates in between them. And those frames are the actual important frames to the video. So you could, one, just take those keyframes, which is a very much smaller subset of it, frames from the video. And then you could start to average them together or use some algorithm that creates a descriptor of a bunch of frames at once. And then you could use that single descriptor to then run uh, some type of object detection or analysis on and that way you could reduce the amount of, of frames you have to actually deal with. Yeah. Can you go to 28? Wow, a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do you just, when you're looking at that basket, how do you determine where to draw your edge? Between your query image and the borrowed image or between the host image and the query? So when, when constructing your providence graph, how do you determine where that edge goes? Oh, so like, could it could it be that the could, the... could the edge go between the borrower image and the host? Could it have actually grabbed it from the host and not? Yes, the yeah, it could have. Uh -huh. So how do you account for that? Um, well, that's a great question. And uh, actually, it was one of the things Dr. Delk was bringing up is there isn't, uh, isn't like this unifying um, description of how provenance works. So do you make an edge between this image and this image or between the host and this image? Right? You, you don't actually know it's ambiguous. So currently, the way that um, uh, the DARPA program has described it, there is a non-ambiguous edge between every image connection. However, that's just not the case. So like that point is really actually pretty good uh, because um, that particular case, you wouldn't know. There's two right answers. Hmm? So, so is your algorithm work well on, say, if the image is not the same structural, so if it's like elongated or something like that, but the cluster for the focal point won't be in the same place, so what happens then? The, um, what slide is that? Say like the puddle, if you made the puddle longer, will it still find it? Oh, you're close. I guess I have to <laughs> So, you're talking about this, in general? Something like that, yeah. Um, just like made the dolphin or whatever just like stretch out. Yeah, so in the bottom one you can see the dolphin is stretching vertically. Sorry, it's a little bit tough to see, especially with the lights on. That's just like it. Um, but as it stretches vertically, that focal point stays relatively uh, strong until you get to a particular level, then you can see it begin to break down. Um, it doesn't really matter where the focal point lies. So that's the great thing about it. It doesn't need to sit directly on the image. It could even be, you know, halfway across the image. It just needs to be a common place for the object to vote towards. Um, and as long as it vote towards it, uh, you can cluster that, the density of those votes. And then look at where those votes were coming from originally. Um, so in terms of the location of the focal point, it's, it's not as important as long as the clustering is happening. So uh, in this case, that's what allows it to work so well in, under, uh, under stretching conditions or other transforms. That's a good question. Uh, I haven't tested it under that. I would assume that you'd start to see two focal points appear, um, or at least the focal point would stretch out further. 
have you had any problem like when well you mentioned that you have like a way to de-rotate and then have all the the focus points go to the same one even if the image the image is rotated. Have mm -hmm. you had any problem when you have different rotations of the same image in the same picture? Um, no, so uh, actually, that's, a, that's another good question. Um, since it's object, it's, this is based on an object by object instance of matching. Um, it uses a single focal point, but both of those objects are going to go towards that focal point. So if, if you've got, like, say, two versions of the dolphin on either side of the image, That'll probably be the most adverse scenario because the focal point will land right in the middle and they both have to vote really far away. But one of them is going to vote with rotated vectors and one of them is not because they all have their own orientations. So they'll still both be able to do it and then you'll get clusters for each the left and the right image. Yeah, so If not, then um, we're going to kick you out. <laughs>